Welcome to you today. I'm Paul Pepis, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Christopher Chavez, assistant professor of media studies and advertising. Oh, I should say, newly promoted associate mm -hmm. professor of media studies and advertising in the School of Journalism and Communication at the University of Oregon. Chavez's research focuses on the ways in which global media industries organize and reorganize collective identity and the degree to which marginalized communities can be empowered within the constraints of market dynamics. He's the author of Reinventing the Latino Television Viewer, Language, Ideology, and Practice, and co-editor of the essay collection Identity, Beyond Tradition and McWorld Neoliberalism. Thanks, Chris, for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. And congratulations on the promotion. Thank you so much. So before you came to the Academy, you spent 10 years as an advertising executive. What brought you back into the Academy? Why did you decide to leave the advertising industry? Uh, well, in between that time, so right after I graduated with an undergraduate in marketing, uh, at night I would go to school at USC in a comm management program. So it was very practitioner oriented, but they mm -hmm. snuck a little bit of theory in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really fell in love with it. And it's so one of those things that I had always intended to go back to. Um, but careers move on and, and life moves forward. Uh, and it got to a point where I, I think my family and I decided it's either now or never. Uh, and so I went back to USC and, and glad that they had me, they took <laughs> me back. Um, and so I was able to finish my doctoral work there. So given you have that experience, mm -hmm. you, can you, do you bring to bear your experience in the industry, in your research? Does it help you? Does it inform your work? Absolutely, and this is one of the things I try to teach my graduate students, is if you're going to understand a media industry, you have to understand the mechanics of it, like how exactly it works. Mm -hmm. So to understand film, you have to understand the filmmaking process. And in this case, having an understanding of advertising and advertising practices helped me in a couple of w different ways. So, you know, the, the, the production process and how it actually works, but also getting access to informants, being able to ingratiate myself within this community. Um, and so it started there. And, and Actually, my dissertation idea started when I was still a practitioner because I remember being in some of these meetings where there were really credible agencies, but they fumbled in terms of working with consumers that were not dominant, white, and mainstream, uh, and watching how a really credible, smart group of people would just fumble this issue. And so that was one of the, the questions going into my doctoral program that I wanted to study. At the time, I just didn't have the theoretical framework or understanding or the language to, to do it. Uh, and so that was what uh, USC really helped me with. Hmm. Interesting. So your monograph is titled Reinventing the Latino Television Viewer. Before you tell us about how the Latino viewer has been reinvented, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about the history of Hispanic media in the U.S. Uh, leading up until that reinvention. Right, and it's typically been framed as a modern phenomenon, but it goes back several hundred years. I mean, where I grew up in California was once part of Mexico. Uh, and then the geographic boundaries had moved. Uh, so there had always been some form of Latino media uh, going back over 200 years. And so it's been reinvented over that time. So originally it had been hyper-local. So a newspaper, the very first Hispanic newspaper, for example, was speaking to a Latino that was a Spanish expatriate who lived, you know, uh, still was seeking news from Spain uh, mm -hmm. during the French-Spanish Wars. Uh, when it came to California, it was somebody that had basically went to bed one night uh, as a Californian woke up the next day as, as a U.S. citizen and a marginalized U.S. citizen. Uh, and so that construct has evolved uh, significantly over the course of time. Uh, when you introduce broadcast, then th the requirements change where you have to reach a national audience. So you start to find the connective codes that can um, connect the Puerto Rican living in New York or the Cuban living in Miami and the uh, Mexicano living in California. Uh, so finding some sort of connective tissue that unites all of these people. Uh, and that process just expands from there. So prior to this more con recent reinvention, what was that connective process? Prior to this reinvention, the last reinvention, the most recent one, mm -hmm. what, what, what was connecting this national audience of various mm -hmm. uh, Latino uh, listeners and viewers? Yeah, there were a lot of myths and assumptions that united it. So part of it was that they were not part of the mainstream. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, practitioners made an active argument that, okay, the Latino is, is somebody different, and they think differently, and they feel differently. Uh, so it was their otherness, I think, that defined them. But the Spanish language was really central to that, that part. So framing them as not being able to, to be spoken to with English language media, somebody that was reliant on Spanish and then uh, had all intentions to keep the language. Uh, and so that was a big part of it, so the Spanish-speaking nature of it. Okay, so now you, this 
reinvention of the Latino viewer. How's that viewer being reinvented by these media companies? Yeah, what I found is that they're starting to be mainstreamed. Uh, and so before what was basically allowed Univision to become such a dominant force was that nobody was paying attention to this market. So the three dominant networks, ABC, CBS, and NBC, had no real interest. Mm -hmm. um, and so Univision really came in with a unique product in the marketplace uh, and went gangbusters. Uh, and so the only real competitors was NBC's Telemundo. Mm -hmm. And uh, recently they've been catching grounds, but for the most part, Univision has dominated the space. Um, and so one of Univision's strategies was to emphasize the otherness. They love this idea that Latinos are Spanish speaking because that provides them unique access to this consumer. Mm -hmm. um, what's happened in recent years with the demographic shifts, all of a sudden, uh, mainstream marketers are starting to pay attention to this market. Uh, if you can equate a community to their economic buying power, all of a sudden, Disney becomes very interested. Uh, NBC starts investing more money into this. And so you have mainstream media companies wanting to pursue the market. And so they're entering the space, uh, and they're coming at it with a very different organizational structure. So tell us a little bit about this market. So how many people are we talking about, and what are the demographics of this of this population that makes, it, uh, makes this population appealing to these mainstream com companies that used to not even think about this? A couple stuff. of things. So the first thing is the, just the peer size of it. So it's 16% of the population currently. Uh, the pro projected demographic increase is exponentialized from there. Right. Uh, so already here in, in Oregon, for example, uh, and this is part of the demographic factors, is that the white audience is getting older, and so they're graying. Uh, when you look at the youth, it's, it's much more individuals of color. Mm -hmm. And so here in Oregon, if you look at kindergartners, for example, and I think the statistic that I heard was one in three kindergartens are, are currently Latino, mm -hmm. and that number will get bigger and bigger. So it's really impacting all sorts of institutions. Uh, from a marketing standpoint, the combination of the demography and the youth impacts uh, several sectors in particular. It would be uh, home and building, automotive, education, finance, uh, and there's a couple of others, but there's some sectors that are particularly interested in this change because it's gonna profoundly impact their businesses. So in, in the book, among many parts of the book that are interesting, you talk about fusion, which is this, mm -hmm. this new media effort launched, uh, the, the CTV, it's coming from CTV, right? It's a Disney, Disney, Disney. Owned. So what's the concept behind fusion, mm -hmm. and how does it reflect this new interest in mainstreaming? Yes. This new, new Latino. Yeah, and so the market's changing, and, and I think uh, you have all of these different players that are trying to figure out ways to access the market. So Univision wants to retain their market share, but at the same time they know they have to evolve, uh, that they're going to be challenged on this market. So they're going to have to move into now English-speaking spaces. And so that was something that would never do. They protected the Spanish-speaking world mm -hmm. uh, almost religiously. And so now they know how they have to defer to some degree. Uh, on the other hand, you have English language networks that had never really been interested in this market all of a sudden pursuing. So Fusion is a, a joint effort between Univision and then ABC News, which is owned by Disney. So it's, I think it's an experiment for both parties. Uh, at this point, since the book has been written, I think Disney is not really finding it a successful mm -hmm, experiment. Mm -hmm. Univision is, so they're the one that's probably going to take control of it. Uh, and they really have in terms of content. And what was, the, I mean, so these are English-speaking Latinos that they're aiming for. Mm -hmm. And this demographic is a growing demographic? It is, and because, um, so there are now more Latinos that are here um, through natural pro processes. They were mm -hmm. born here in the United States, which is a shift from immigration. Uh, and so they're growing up in two worlds, at, at least that's the construct. They're growing up with multiple languages. Uh, and so the framing of it is that they're, they're kind of the 2.0 generation. Mm -hmm. uh, that they come in, they speak English, uh, they're bicultural, and so that becomes sort of the, the, the sweet spot for many marketers. And your, your book is really helpful, I think, in, in helping us to understand that, that these media companies come up with these categories, mm -hmm. the new Latino, yep. and they, they, they're very committed to these categories, right. but it's not entirely clear that these categories are real. Right, exactly. I mean, uh, these are social constructs, uh, and they're imposing these social constructs on a population that is messy and complicated and diverse, uh, and so uh, there's the uh, potential to really flatten out uh, really complicated and diverse, interesting communities. Uh, and so they you know, create this idea of living in two worlds, almost a bifurcated notion of what Latino identity is. You either speak English or Spanish or some combination of both. Uh, and so there are very few options that are available. Uh, but it's always done in, in particular ways. So based, based on 
uh, cultural affinity, but less on, say, for example, national identity mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, or regional identity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So one of the things that the book is very attentive to is the dynamics of what you call linguistic capital. Mm -hmm. So help us understand what, what you mean by linguistic capital and why that's crucial in your, in your analysis. Mm -hmm. And this is a topic that I've been really interested in, in in different parts of my research, but the way that we speak and how the way that we speak can have value in some conditions and not in others. Mm. Uh, and in this case, how it can have economic value in certain conditions or in others. Uh, and so, and my mother hates telling uh, me telling this story, but when I was growing up, uh, she deliberately did not want us to speak Spanish. Uh, she thought it was not, she couldn't see any use for it in the world that she grew up with. Mm -hmm. uh, so she couldn't imagine a moment in which uh, speaking Spanish might have some form of currency. And you could argue that in, in most of life in the United States, it doesn't. Uh, but there are certain conditions in which it might. Uh, so in this case, uh, having uh, the capacity to speak to to speak Spanish, if you're a cultural producer, gives you access then to markets that are either Spanish dominant or at least Spanish proficient. Mm -hmm. um, if it's true to some degree that younger Latinos uh, are fully uh, bilingual and e maybe even predominantly English speakers, mm -hmm. Why, what's the problem with sort of thinking beyond Spanish language media? Why, why is this mainstreaming problematic? W what are the downsides of this mainstreaming effort? Yeah, when you look at kind of the traditional role that Hispanic media has played is to tell the stories, to speak to consumers that had traditionally been left out of mainstream media. Uh, mainstream media typically focuses on the most educated, most included, mm -hmm. um, typically middle class, the ideal consumer. Uh, and so they are already overserved. Uh, by mainstreaming the, uh, the Latino audience, you're basically abandoning the, um, the audience that had traditionally been served by Latino media uh, in favor of somebody that's already inclined to engage in civic discourses, already inclined to be included just by definition of who they are. Uh, so the purpose that Hispanic media or Latino media had traditionally served uh, now shifts away. Uh, and that's kind of a recurring frame that you see uh, with media that had started off with some sort of an advocacy role mm -hmm. or filling a niche that hadn't been served in the marketplace, that there's a mainstreaming process there. And so their their role shifts. So you, you mentioned how Disney's efforts don't seem to be taking off. Univision seems to be s more successful. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about their efforts. And because they still are uh, providing the same kind of programming that they have traditionally done, yes? Mm -hmm. But they're adding new programming? How is that working? Yeah, so Disney is an interesting case because they haven't paid much attention to the Latino market, especially in their children's programming, for yeah, example, yeah, which yeah. is a conspicuous absence given the, the, the younger demographic of the Latino audience. Uh, and part of it, I mean, part of it, and this is my assumption, is that they, they don't have to. I mean, they're a pretty right. conservative company. They're right. doing very well. Uh, and when you're doing well, the status quo seems to be the, the appropriate response. There's no urgency to create any kind of need. Uh, so another research that I've done on their children's programming, uh, compared to Nickelodeon or Viacom's Cartoon Network, uh, they're pretty conservative. Hmm. And so uh, that's traditionally been their s approach to it. Uh, so I think they had outsourced it to Univision to, to see what could be done, and they were really primarily an investor in, th in that project. I see, I see. Uh, and so the one of the things that I've noticed with Fusion, it's and this is true with any kind of upstart network, is it's constantly in evolution, and especially in its first couple of years. I mean, it's trying to survive in a very competitive mm -hmm, marketplace. Mm -hmm. So even since the book has been written, it's pivoted from being a Latino network and overtly positioning itself as a Latino network to being a multicultural network, mm. to being a millennial network, and oh, they're wow. trying to find the right sweet spot so that they can get the biggest possible audience while still, at least in name, trying to serve its original intent. Hmm. Um, but these are always interesting cases, like I think about the History Network. Probably started off with really good intentions of <laughs> wanting to educate the, the audience on history, and then it becomes uh, about Bigfoot. Yeah, right. Uh, and so I think <laughs> it's just the, the reality of, of a, a new property trying to survive in the marketplace. So despite demographics, market promise, this interest of the mainstream media companies and Latino audiences, there still remains a lack of Latino producers, directors, writers, and media execs. Mm -hmm. What are some of the efforts or changes that might be undertaken to try to remedy that situation? Uh, so there's some promise in online television, uh, so the ability for independent filmmakers to come in and contribute right away. Uh, and that's still an experiment in, that's happening right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are some really good cases of, of filmmakers that um, 
were shut out of the studio system, found a following online. Um, but at the same time, the, the networks are really interested in that space as well. So they also come in with heavier budgets, uh, more recognized actors, and they come in and can push people out. So it, it's still a space to be determined whether uh, new artists, new filmmakers, new actors, new kinds of faces, stories that can be told can enter uh, through the digital space and find some sort of momentum there. Uh, it has been successful for some artists, um, but there's also a ton of stuff that just goes unnoticed or uh, never finds an audience. Yeah, I know you wrote an article, I think it was in the conversation about um, South by Southwest, mm -hmm. which takes place right, right, right. in yeah. Texas. Yeah. And there are no Latino performers, even though there are tons of Latino performers. Right, in Austin, Texas, yeah. which is predominantly Latino. Uh, and that's what you see is these spaces start off as being very open and very democratic. Uh, but it doesn't take very long for dominant players to really come in and, and figure out the marketplace and figure out how to, to work the marketplace. Um, so what are some of the consequences, negative consequences of this lack of Latinos in these creative and executive positions on how Latinos are portrayed in mainstream media? Just uh, I think the, the limited tropes that we're continuing to see, um, and even sometimes you'll get uh, Latinos that, that go through the system and they um, become used to the, the, the Hollywood system and telling the same kinds of stories. So sometimes it's not even the race and ethnicity of the producer, mm -hmm. but rather the, the culture through which they were groomed. And, mm -hmm. and the example that I'm thinking about is, is a show called Devious Maids mm -hmm. by Eva Longoria, who should know better, you mm -hmm. know, but here we are you know, perpetuating the trope of the Latina maid. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's such a limited vocabulary that we have already to talk about um, Latino culture and Latino individuals. Uh, and that you want diversity of ideas and diversity of stories, uh, which we're just not getting at this point. And I think lack of involvement. Um, Do you think it's inevitable that that problem's gonna be solved just because of the demographics? I mean, you point out, mm -hmm. I, I can't remember what year it's gonna be, but there will be a year right. when people of color are the majority population in the right. United States, and the largest population will be of Hispanic descent, right? Mm -hmm. So is it just inevitable that this problem is gonna be solved, or do you think, I mean, are you optimistic about that? I, I'm not, uh, because I've really seen, and this is not necessarily unique to the media industries. I mm -hmm. mean, everybody's dealing with it, the universities are mm -hmm, dealing with mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. um, any kind of cultural institution or exclusive institution is dealing with it. But there's such a uh, tendency towards the status quo uh, and the resistance to change in the face of demographic change or these profound changes. Uh, so I think there are some cases where it becomes overwhelming. Uh, Bordeaux, for example, talks about shocks to right. neighboring fields that cause people, like there are just these disruptions that happen that where people have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And maybe the demographic tip will happen so quickly and so profoundly that um, um, that they might have to confront it. But I've, I've a consistent theme is that institutions are, are very adept at resisting change mm -hmm. and perpetuating the status quo. <laughs> so. Um, do you, are you aware of there, are there any media outlets that are specifically aimed to serve Latinos in Oregon? So uh, on a radio level, so here in Eugene, for example, Gabuena is one of the first radio stations, I, I think in the area, uh, to have a frequency. Um, but in terms of television, just because of the cost startups, there, there's mm -hmm. not the same opportunity. Um, Univision might have some affiliate stations that are based in the Portland area, the Woodland area. Um, but in terms of, of the local area, not as mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Do you, it, it just occurs to me, are you seeing the, you know, the way in which um, the diversification, maybe that's not the right word, the expansion of the media mm -hmm. uh, companies. So now we've got Netflix and Hulu and Amazon that are, you know, producing things and like doing these test pilots and stuff. Has that been helpful in opening doors for Latino producers or yeah. creators? In really interesting way, so on one hand, you have the consolidation of the media industry. So mm -hmm. there are fewer players out there uh, and a limited number of players that are controlling most of those messages. And you see some conservative effect happening there. Uh, but with the online sources, there's some really interesting, um, but it's mostly international content. Ah, and so you're starting to see shows that are produced in Cuba, for example, uh -huh. finding their way in, into the United States, which is, again, really interesting from a perspective, but it, it doesn't necessarily address the US Latino uh, experience because you can have some great content that's coming from Spain or mm -hmm. from Venezuela and from Cuba. I said, these are, are shows that never would have really found a market here, um, but all of a sudden do. Mm -hmm. and, and again, it makes for rich and, and diverse and interesting uh, programming, but it doesn't necessarily solve the U.S. Latino experience. Mm -hmm. So I'm just gonna shift gears a little bit. Absolutely. Huh? 
Um, you recently wrote another article for the conversation on the state of public media mm -hmm. in the United States. So first, remind us um, what led to the establishment of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting in 1967. What was the motivation there? It had been a long push. So originally, uh, when radio was the advent of radio, uh, all the commercial networks really came in. So it, it, it almost immediately became a commercially owned space. Uh, Westinghouse, General mm -hmm. Electric really mm -hmm. came in and owned it. Uh, and so um, the educational radio movement, so these are frequencies that were owned by churches, universities had a big part of it, uh, had pushed to try to at least dedicate some space towards public radio. Um, originally their attempts were thwarted, so they were given some space, but it was on uh, the experimental dials and they were given really the unpleasant frequencies. Uh, and so after some push, and it was a very, very long effort, um, there was the Radio Broadcasting Act of 1967, I believe, and that's when they started to um, establish the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, which in turn gave us NPR uh, and, um, why am I blanking out on it, uh, uh, PBS. PBS. Public right. So when, they, what was, when it was originally founded, what was its aim? What were the aims? Yeah, there were, there were really two primary missions, which is what made it very different from the BBC, for example. Mm -hmm. So when the mm -hmm. BBC was established, it was uh, entertainment and education for the masses. Uh, with NPR, it was much more of a democratic, at least uh, in pretense, the democratic goals. So there were two goals. One was to uh, represent a more diverse swath of the nation, uh, which they believed that broadcasting hadn't done at that point. And then the second was to cultivate a more civically engaged citizen. Uh, so it was very much uh, democracy building. It, it, at least that's uh, part of the fabric of it. So that's 1967, so we're years and years out. Mm -hmm. What? What's the what's it like now, and mm -hmm. how did it become that way? So part of it was the funding model. Uh, so right now, it really speaks to primarily an audience of baby boomers, college educated, uh, high wealth. So not even middle class, but it tends to skew more affluent. Uh, that is the ideal listener. Uh, and so part of it is just not being able to rely on consistent funding um, from the federal government. And so they were always in the position of having to again, see where they were going to be in a year, and if they had growth potential, where were those monies going to come from? And so they had to turn towards a, a more lucrative audience, uh, and they also had to look for corporate donations. Uh, so it's the economic model that really drives who their audience is. Um, they're also confronting this issue of the demographics that are changing pretty profoundly, mm -hmm. and they also know that they have to deal with it in, in pretty significant ways. At the same time, there's something very appealing about the status quo, mm -hmm. uh, and so they've been resistant to that. And so What's going to be interesting to see, because I'm currently working on a book project on it, is, um, okay, we want Latinos, but we also want this high wealth, so do they marry the two? Do they define their ideal Latino audience as somebody that is college educated and high wealth and already civically engaged, which is going to undermine the, the original purpose of, of what they were trying to do? Is there, I mean, do you think the original purpose really obtains at all anymore? For, uh, you know, unfortunately, I feel like that that role has been occupied in weird ways by commercial media. Mm. So Spanish language media, particularly in Los Angeles, there's a huge tradition of civic activism. So they are much more civically engaged than NPR would ever be. Um, they s are speaking to the, the most marginalized communities. And so this is one of those weird spaces where commercial media has stepped in and mm. assumed the role that public radio sh should have been assuming all along. So what, what a, do you have a sense of like what percentage of uh, Corporation for Public Broadcasting, what percentage of their funds come from the government? Very little. So, uh, and I don't want to be necessarily quoted on this, but around 14 to 15 percent, and a large uh, comes from corporate foundations uh, and individual subscriptions. So, since the vast majority is from corporate funders and private sources, I mean, it, it probably isn't going to have an, a, a huge impact on what's produced mm -hmm. if federal state funding goes to zero. Right. Because it's already in effect, I mean, it's it's basically private already. Right. Yeah. Um, so you, you mentioned that this is a book project that you're working mm -hmm. on. So tell us a little bit about that project. Say a little bit more about it, or if you haven't already said everything you're Yeah, no, say. no, definitely. So it, it was really interesting, th that bigger question of to what degree to, has public radio served those two original mandates. Uh, and so I'm looking at it from multiple perspectives. So I'm looking at it from a linguistic perspective. Uh, so the piece that I'm working on right now, for example, is, is the NPR voice. Mm. Um, and mm. um, so I've been in interviewing voice trainers, people that work at NPR as voice trainers, to understand like the very limited spectrum that they work within, um, even though they're supposed to represent very diverse voices. 
So compared to other networks like PRI International, NPR is much more reluctant to have untranslated language mm -hmm. uh, or correspondence with accents. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they tend to operate within a spectrum. But also looking at news, music's going to be another chapter, uh, and then civic engagement, I think it's going to be the big portion of it. Uh, so I've been able to interview station managers. Um, I was in Harlem a couple of weeks ago interviewing the producers of Latino USA. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and so I was able to um, access uh, many of these folks. So, uh, so I'm in that process right so now. So what about Latino USA? Because that's not a, s I mean, there are definitely people who have accented speech and mm -hmm. there are definitely, sp you know, translations going on for Spanish speakers. Yeah. How, how does that show do? Is it is it successful in their... It is pretty successful, and, and they've been able to offshoot into different kinds of properties. So now they're beyond just radio. They're working on some television, uh, video production. Uh, and they're uh, the Futuro Media Group. And yeah. so they're an independent entity. Uh, and a lot of it is the support of, of particular kinds of do donors that are interested in their work. Uh, and the head of the, uh, the program, uh, Maria Hinojosa, mm -hmm. is very, very active in terms of getting the brand out and being very supportive of it. Um, so the piece that I'm working on with them is just more about under what conditions can an organization thrive in this kind of environment because they, uh, they are one of the bright spots that you start to see in, in public radio. Uh, other than them, there's not a ton of, of diversity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we just have a minute or so sure. left. So why don't I just sit, ask you to tell us about what you're teaching right now. What class are you teaching right oh, now? Oh, I'm teaching a graduate methods course, uh, so qualitative methods. And so we're uh, focusing on uh, how to, to speak with individuals, how to interview, do focus groups, and now we're, we're focusing more now on text-based research, so analyzing texts and looking at discourses that come out of those texts. Can you say just, I mean, we have like a minute left. Sure. What's, what, what's going on in schools of journalism now? What, where, I mean, you're always hearing about the, you know, the decline of the newspaper industry and mm -hmm. the reconfiguration of, of the journalist um, journalistic fields. What's it like in a journalism school in the 21st century? I think a lot of uncertainty right now. So uh, again, just the idea of objectivity uh, in these times specifically, uh, and the degree to which you're an advocate, uh, but also false news is one of the big issues right mm. now. I was just at World Press Freedom Day in Indonesia, uh, and globally, not just here in the United States, everybody's dealing with that idea of the proliferation of misinformation that's out there, uh, which is really undermining the role of traditional journalists. So I think that's one of the things that, that people are confronting globally right now. Well, on that not entirely cheerful note, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chris, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you for having me. I've been speaking with Christopher Chavez, assistant professor, I did it again, associate professor of media studies and advertising in the School of Journalism and Communication at the University of Oregon. He's the author of Reinventing the Latino Television Viewer, Language, Ideology, and Practice. Thanks so much for watching. Thank you.